Greetings and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, we have a very special guest in studio and uh, someone who I'm greatly happy to have here with us, uh, Dale Ratzliff. Dale, great to have you here, brother. Good to be here. Uh, Dale, you were a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. That's right. And uh, so obviously anyone that's watched our shows, and we have over 500 of them now on the Internet, on YouTube, uh, anyone that's watched our shows or pays attention to our Sea Answers TV uh, YouTube channel knows that uh, we get experts on a lot of subjects uh, speaking on things that they specialize in. So I think it's pretty obvious at this point that uh, since you are a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist, that your expertise is in that religion. So what we'd like to know is, I get ready to have you start speaking about this, and also you're a prolific author, uh, you have a, a ministry of your own, website, magazine, we're gonna get into all that. Uh, but uh, before we get into that, I'd just like to mention to our viewers that uh, we have uh, newsletters of our ministry right here, free to anyone that wants to get a copy of, of these magazines, or not really magazines, but uh, newsletters. And uh, if you need any other help, we have three websites, as you can see on your screen, uh, and uh, you're f free to call or email us for any assistance you might need. But with that said, Dale, I'd like you to tell our, tell our viewers, and this is the main purpose for this, a lot of viewers may not know who you are, may not know what you've done uh, and all these things, and that's the whole purpose of this. Please uh, inform us as to All right. who you are. <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, I come from a very strong Adventist family. My grandfather uh, was one of the vice presidents of the General Conference. My grandmother was a denominationally employed evangelistic uh, Bible worker. My uh, grandfather my, I should say my w grandmother's brother was the vice president of the General Conference. My grandfather was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. My mother and father uh, both were missionaries in Panama and raised up a little Adventist church in the Panamanian jungle. Um, so we have strong Adventist roots. Um, I was married to Carolyn Mundahl who had a was a fourth generation or fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it was interesting. We uh, knew each other in the third and fourth grades. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we met again in high school and became boyfriend, girlfriend, got married after one year of college. Uh, I was pastoring in Sedona Christian Fellowship. Uh, one of my members wanted me to give a Bible study to some Adventists. And I said, let them lead at first till we get acquainted with them. They brought out the clear word, Adventist Bible. And it just so happened it was on Daniel 8, 14, which I knew. I'd studied that thoroughly. And I read that clear word Bible, and they had added a whole bunch of Ellen White stuff right in the text in the quotes from an angel in Daniel 8, you know, the angel. They talks. just added to the Word of God. They just added to the Word of God. And something rose up in me, uh, Holy Spirit or something. I said, this must stop mm -hmm. because this is an outright lie. I knew I mean, I had studied that subject well, okay, mm -hmm. and I knew that was an outright lie. So I, that, that's when I wrote Cultic Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And I did it in six months, 700 footnotes, and it's, it's an in-depth study of the whole beginnings of the Adventist Church, the shut door, which most Adventists don't know about, and the investigative judgment, and that Ellen White is, is a false prophet. Amen. So that's how come I wrote Cultic Doctrine. And then I... Um, I kept getting emails. Uh, I sold quite a few books, okay? Yeah. Uh, of people who asked me questions. Why I left the Adventist Church and so on. And I finally decided, rather than answering all these emails, I'd write uh, Truth Led Me Out. Uh, yes. All my story, which I basically told right, here. Right, right. And then uh, people were, uh, evangelicals were saying, can you give me a little summary of the problems of Adventism? And that's mm -hmm. why I wrote Truth About Adventist Truth. Mm -hmm. And that lists the 10 main problems of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You might call them the same, the ten major differences between Adventism and Evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's just a summary. It's 88 pages long, easy read, but it's documented well enough so you can do more study uh, mm -hmm. to do it. Now, I've got a book here in my hand called Sabbath in Christ. 
Could you, uh, could you tell the people at home about this book? Sure. Sabbath in Christ is a result of a, a group study that took us seven months uh, in a church that I pastored shortly after I left the SDA church. And it's a thorough study of the topic of the Sabbath, the covenants, and the gospel. And uh, many theologians have endorsed it. It's our number one bestseller. It, we have received thousands of emails and letters from people who have been blessed by that book. It's been revised three times, and it's, uh, I think it's in its fifth printing. And uh, it, it will help you answer uh, all the questions you have regarding the topic of the Sabbath. Well, praise God for that. Okay, now here's a, a very special book. It's a book that you haven't written. No. <laughs> it's called My Cup Overflows by Carolyn Ratzliff. So yeah. what can you tell us here? Well, this is interesting. Uh, Carolyn is, has been my girlfriend since the third and fourth grade, okay, in, in, in high school and, and, and so on. And um, she wanted to write her experience of leaving the Adventist church. But she wanted to include a lot about our own personal journey in Adventism. And um, an interesting thing in this book was that when we were having our 50th wedding anniversary, my wife was going through, Carolyn was going through some things that my mother had left after she died. She died in 06. And she found a little um, card there that was a Valentine's card. And it said, it showed a, a blindfolded girl chasing a boy. And it said, even though I can't see you, I can seize you. <laughs> and Carolyn said, why in the world did your mom keep that? She turned it over. And on the back it says, Carolyn Mundahl. She wrote that to me in the third grade <laughs> when I was in the fourth grade. So she picks up there and shares our life together in school and high school and so on. And uh, a lot of people have said that's an easy reading book and they really enjoyed it. It's not an e-book. The rest of them are e-books too on Amazon and, and, mm -hmm. and Barnes and Noble. That had too many pictures in it. So right. all the pictures of our, our journey right. together right. are there. Uh, and speaking of uh, publications and things, uh, You've got a very special publication here called the Proclamation Magazine. Now, this particular one I'm looking at as New Adventist President Sets Course affirms the Adventist gospel. Uh, so, basically, can, what can you tell us about the Proclamation Magazine overall, its history, uh, how, how often do you publish it, circulation, things like that. Uh, and then you had mentioned to me before we started filming that this was a very good issue. So what can it's, you tell it's us a good issue for a couple of things. Uh, did Adventist leaders lie to Walter Martin? See, uh, most evangelicals yes. will say, well, Adventists aren't, aren't cults because of what Walter Martin said. Right, right. They don't know that Adventists d deceived him. Right. Okay. In fact, uh, I, uh, you know, just for my own ministry, I actually, on YouTube, I've done a lot of shows on Seventh-day Adventists in the past, and so I've dealt with a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, and I get that Walter Martin arg argument, and because I've been getting your procl Proclamation Magazine all these years, and when I saw this one, I That's saved a good it, one. Yeah. and I made copies of this, and uh, I use your material here to answer these Seventh-day Adventists about Walter Martin on YouTube. Right. And it's come in very handy because then they're speechless. They have nothing they can say because of the well-documented uh, material you have here. Now, it, for someone watching, can they contact your ministry to get a, a subscription? Or Yes, it's, a, it's sent free to about 30,000 homes wow. four times a year, 32-page, full color. Wow. Uh, it has a fascinating history. I'll yes, give that yes. right now. I got you. Okay, and then you also, uh, with your ministry, have a, a website. Can you tell us a little bit about your yeah. website? We have f uh, four websites I'd like to mention. My website is called lifeassuranceministries.com. Lifeassuranceministries.com. You're seeing that on the screen. Okay. On the screen. Uh, second uh, one is lifeassuranceministries.org. Now, okay. my.com deals with the books and, and many different articles, and I even have uh, books they can download on my website. Uh, LifeInsuranceMinistries.org deals with proclamation. Oh, okay. okay. The Proclamation Magazine. Right, the Proclamation. And they can sign up free and get it, okay. okay. Um, then there's FormerAdventist.com. Okay. That is a, a former Adventist forum, and that's run by Richard and Colleen Tinker, who are now the, uh, you might say, the president and the editors of Proclamation. Okay. okay, I was 
but I'm getting up in years. I wanted to hand it over to somebody who's got more energy and <laughs> a longer life than I am. <laughs> anyway, um, the fourth one is truthorfables.com. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a website that was developed by someone else. It is huge. He, he was a former Adventist pastor. Mm -hmm. And it has a huge amount of material on Ellen White and Adventist issues. You could spend hours and hours and hours there going through it and searching mm -hmm. it. So uh, our, our, our um, uh, nonprofit corporation owns that now. Okay. So, uh, it, it's, so all those websites are phenomenal research for anybody that wants to know the truth about Seventh-day Adventists. So often when I'm getting emails and phone calls off the, the Seventh-day Adventist programs we've already put up on YouTube and on public access TV and everything, uh, the, the people are, uh, a lot of them are coming out and they want to know more and, 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 and they just have ravenous appetites. You know, I've got a bunch of tracks and things I give them. I give them Xerox copies of some of your stuff and all that. Uh, but uh, these four websites you're mentioning sounds like just the ticket for a lot of these people that want to really dig in and spend a lot of serious study time to really get to the bottom yeah. of this issue. Yeah, Proclamation has been going since 2000, and so there is a wealth of information there, and they can download it, okay? Right, right. Uh, Ministries.org. you can go back and download a full-color one in a PDF file. You mm -hmm. can print out on your printer, mm -hmm. and so it's all available free. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, the director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. And I want to thank you for joining us for another production of Christian Answers Presents. I'm in studio with a very special guest, Dale Ratzliff. Thank you, Dale. You're all the way from Arizona. Yes. I think Phoenix, Arizona. No, uh, Camp Verde. It's near between Phoenix and Flagstaff. Oh, I got you. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm just a Texas boy. I've been kind of stuck here in the state. I don't get out but get out much, so I haven't learned the geography out there. But still, it's a, an honor and a privilege to have you here with us. I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> and as the folks at home have already seen from our uh, promo leading into this uh, main presentation, uh, they already know your background, the books you've written, your ministry, the website, the magazine proclamation. And uh, we've decided in this program to uh, uh, kind of center in on uh, your presentation on truth about Adventist truth. And uh, since you're the main expert on this and the author of the book, I would like you to kind of pick up the ball and uh, take our viewers into the truth about Adventist truth. All right, we'll do that. <clears throat> First of all, let me say that this presentation is not designed for Seventh-day Adventists, okay? It's designed for evangelicals. Now, obviously, there will be some Seventh-day Adventists somewhere who may run across it and, and watch it. And if you're that person, I would just invite you to uh, consider what we're, we're going, going to say. Uh, you'll probably feel like you're trying to drink from a fire hose uh, too much, too fast, uh, without any uh, full uh, answers to some of the questions you'll have. But I invite you to listen carefully because um, the Adventist truth isn't all it's cracked up to be. So with that short introduction, I'd like to jump in and talk a little bit about our, uh, our ministry. Life Assurance Ministry's mission statement is to proclaim the good news of the New Covenant Gospel of Grace in Christ and to combat the errors of legalism and, and false religion. I'd like to look first of all at the pattern of false teachers. And as I'm going through these, uh, there are three patterns that I want you to look for. Uh, so you look for these three patterns of false teachers in some, te uh, some text that I'm going to be reading. First one is from Matthew 7:15. It says this: "Beware of false prophets who come to you in the sheep's clothing." but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And then Galatians 2, 4 and 5 says this, 
but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield to them in subjection for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. And then 2 Peter 2, 1 says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Notice the secretly part. <clears throat> and then Jude, this is the Lord's brother uh, of the flesh, said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. And then it says, notice this, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. You kind of get the idea that they're having a meeting and, and these people are kind of creeping in on their hands and knees to become unnoticed. So did you find a pattern of false prophets? I think there's three. They infiltrate the church secretly under disguise, hiding their true identity. Next, their agenda is to put free Christians under bondage. And third, their teachings undermine the apostolic gospel that was once for all handed down to the saints. All right? Now, there's an urgent need for evangelicals to understand the truth about Adventism. There are about 300,000 Seventh-day Adventist members who leave that church every year. Notice that, 300,000. Now, where do we get these figures from? That's an average from their actually figures for the last uh, five years between the general conferences. We got this off their website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, transitioning Adventists have a very unique set of needs that must be met if they're going to make a successful transition into a, a, an Adventist or an evangelical <laughs> church. And these needs are, are three. They must understand the simplicity of the New Covenant gospel. That is so important because they don't understand the gospel. They'll tell you they do, but they really don't. Number two, they must understand the full New Testament teaching regarding the Sabbath. And I invite anybody who's watching this to see our other program called Sabbath in Christ. They must discover that several of the main doctrines of Adventism are unbiblical and undermine the gospel. Now, evangelicals need to understand the cultic core of Adventism. They really don't understand Adventists. Uh, we have been to many pastors' conference. Uh, conferences, and they say, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with Adventists. You know, Walter Martin said they're not a cult, so don't worry about it. But they don't understand the full cultic core of the Adventist church. And evangelical Christians need to understand the pull of Adventist teachings and be equipped with the necessary knowledge and tools to keep them from being proselytized by Adventist evangelism. Adventist evangelism, which we'll get to a little bit later, is very, very compelling for somebody who is not well grounded in biblical hermeneutics. <clears throat> okay, here's the first error and the first difference between Adventism and the evangelical Christianity. The writings of Ellen G. White are a, and this is a quote from their statement of belief, a continuing and authoritative source of truth. Wow. Red now, flag. this is the underlying difference and the major error of the SDA church, which by itself, notice this, moves the Adventist church outside of the Protestant principle of sola scriptura, the Bible alone. Now, they claim they stand on the shoulders of the Adventist or the uh, Protestant reformers, but this one doctrine moves them outside of the Protestant Reformation. Okay, here's the complete statement. As the Lord's messenger, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. 
Now, there's many people who will read that and say, well, Dale, there's nothing wrong with that as long as the Bible is, is behind the thing that's uh, being tested, okay? But let's look at how they really interpret this, okay? I'm going to give some quotations. The Glacier View Statement, uh, this was a big meeting of the Adventist leaders, uh, said this, Her authority transcends that of all non-inspired interpreters of Scripture. So Larry, if you interpret something, you know, using good hermeneutical principles, her authority transcends anything you will do. So if I get the greatest Greek scholar that is recognized as a great Greek scholar by most of evangelical uh, pastors and churches everywhere, and they say, this guy really knows Greek. He's, he's written great books. He's, he's got a, a, you know, a, a history of his education and everything. Uh, that wouldn't count against Ellen G. White. Nope. Now, when it comes to Ellen G. White, as I'm thinking about this, uh, speaking of scholarship, what kind of scholarship, if she transcends everybody on the map, even the greatest preachers of all time, you know, when you look back in church history, if she's better than anybody, then what kind of theological education are we talking about here that makes her so great to be uh, given that honor? No more than a grade school education. Uh, I don't know how long I'd go here. She was hit in the head as a girl and was unconscious for two weeks. Uh, many people think she had uh, epilepsy after that. But um, she's written a stack of books about that high. She, they claim she's the most prolific woman writer in history. But uh, she is very much of a plagiarist, and she had secretaries to do a lot of her writing. But, um, but there they has still to be more than two at the net, though. Why would they say she's better than everybody, even though she got hit in the head with a brick? It seems like, or a rock, or something. It seems like that would be. There, it take more than that to make her such a, a great uh, transcendent person. Well, she claims to have received the spirit of God. They cl she claims to have had two thousand visions. And, um, okay, so there's the key to it. There's the key. Okay. She, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, Robert Olson, and he was a recent secretary of the White Estate, and he said this, I believe that both Ellen G. White and the Apostle Paul were true prophets who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. My reason for believing in the inspiration of one is identical with my reason for believing in the inspiration of the other. So Robert Olson says that her writings have the same authority as the Apostle Paul. Now that's pretty heavy, okay? Yes. Now, Raoul Deterin, who is he? He's Professor of Systematic Theology and Chairman of the Department of uh, Theology and Christian Professor at Andrews University Seminary. And by the way, I had Christology from him. This was years mm -hmm. ago when I was at the seminary. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought he was a great teacher, okay? And that's a Seventh-day Adventist school, Andrews University. Absolutely. He's, he's, he's the head of the seminary. He was the mm -hmm. head man, okay? okay. And uh, he says this, I have found her writings to be an inspired, reliable commentary on the Bible. What I am saying is that I believe the writings of Ellen White are inspired of the Lord. Notice, notice carefully now. We can safely trust them, and this gives us an authoritative understanding of the sacred scriptures. Now, this is the president of the General Conference, Ted Wilson. This, this, he gave this at his, his inaugural speech to the, the thousands of people that were gathered. By the way, it's going to be in, in Austin, Antonio. Texas. Or I thought it was San Antonio. Uh, oh, you're right, San Antonio, Texas in 2015. I'll try to be there. I usually go there. I went there when the Mormons built it. Yeah. When, the, when the Mormons yeah. put their temple up there a few years back, I went out there to hand out some tracts and do some with it. Now, you're about to quote the president. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. He's president of the General Conference, the highest, the highest Seventh-day Adventist se there is. Okay. okay. And this was at his inaugural address to the just after he was voted in as president. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible is paramount in our estimation and ultimate authority and final arbiter of truth. The spirit of prophecy, and any time you have spirit of prophecy or testimonies, think Ellen White's writings, mm -hmm. the spirit of prophecy provides clear, inspired counsel to aid our application of Bible truth. Mm -hmm. It is a heaven-sent guide to instruct the church in how to carry out its mission. Now the next sentence. It is a reliable, theological expositor of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Ted Wilson. Okay, so you see the 
emphasis on Ellen White. Yeah, we, we go by the Bible, but it's a Bible interpreted by Ellen White, mm -hmm. okay? Now, there's, I want to read a, a Bible text and then a text from Ellen White and want you to compare. In fact, I'm going to ask you what you, what you see. <laughs> the first one comes from Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, and it's called, and we think of it as Christ, God's final word. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. Okay? And that tells us that the Son is God's final word. Okay? Notice what Ellen White said. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his Spirit. And that's Ellen White's writings. And she's replacing what we just read in Hebrews with testimonies of His Spirit. Who's she replacing? She's replacing Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And th that's exactly what's going on in Seventh-day Adventism. Yeah. They're replacing Christ with the testimony of Ellen G. White. You got it. You got it. I mean, when, I, when I understood that, I said, man, that if, if there's anything that's heresy, that that's is. It. Okay. <clears throat> now, Adventism, then number two. Now, the first one is Ellen White as a source of truth. Now we go to number two. And this is a, a, a multifaceted one. Adventism was founded on multiple errors. We're going to list them, then we're going to come back and, and look at some of them. Founded on a false prophecy. Founded on a false gospel. We'll talk about that. It had questionable ethics. It covered up many of the early problems. Uh, defective Christology. Many of the Adventist leaders were Arian. They didn't believe Christ was a created being. Mm -hmm. Uh, some thought he was uh, Michael the Archangel, and that's still somewhat present in Adventism, as we'll see. It was f flawed hermeneutics, uh, like when I went to school. I remember in, when I went to Bible doctrines class in high school, one of the questions was, how do we study the Bible? And it was, here a little and there a little. <laughs> that, that was the way we studied. There's nothing about context. Very, very scientific. Proof text method. And this is, <laughs> by the way, this is the, the method that William Miller used to come to the idea that Christ was coming in 1844 mm -hmm. or 1843. A wrong view of the church. They thought they were the only true people. Nobody else was mm -hmm. in the church. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is the chart that William Miller had. <clears throat> it's fascinating. And if you get the book, uh, Cultic Doctrine, uh, you'll see that Miller had 15 lines of prophecy that pointed to Christ coming in 1843. And if you read his 15 lines, it is hilarious. I mean, he even took 666 as a, as a prophecy that Christ was coming in 1843. You say, how did he get there? You ought to, ought to read his thing on it. it it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, I have read uh, Charles Taz Russell's books, who is the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, he comes from the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you read these cultic books by these different groups who are right. predicting the end of the world. You know, even Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, predicted the end of the world in 1891. Right. And he gets all these weird, cockeyed ideas about when the Lord's coming in the last day and all that stuff. But it, it, you see that pattern right. among all the different cults. But anyway, go ahead. Okay, well, this is the, uh, his 15 lines of prophecy dealing with 1843. Okay, that's when he thought Christ would come. And this is what Ellen White said. I have seen the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted them. <laughs> So Ellen White says this 1843 chart, which proved to be false, was directed mm -hmm. by the hand of the Lord. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, notice this. I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time. Notice that? Mm -hmm. In 1843. It was His design to arouse people to bring them to a testing point where they should decide for or against the truth. Thousands were led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller. Early writings, 132. <laughs> Another one. I saw that the nominal churches, that would be the evangelical churches, mm -hmm. okay, have no knowledge or the move made in heaven or the way into the most holy, and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Like the Jews who offered their useless sacrifices, they offer up their useless prayers to the apartment which Jesus had left, and Satan, pleased with the deception of the professed followers, fastens them in his snare. Okay, so if, if you didn't understand what happened in 1843 about the Christ moving to a new mm -hmm. area of the sanctuary, and you prayed, thinking you were praying to God, but he's not in that, in that place anymore, he's moved. Right. Then Satan grabs your prayers and fastens you in deception. 
Now, let me ask you a quick question right here at this point. Now, you're, you're pointing out just absolute point blank false prophecies by this woman, Ellen White, and you coming from a Seventh-day Adventist background, and it, you were in it a long time, yeah. a long time. In fact, how long were you in Seventh-day Adventism before you came out, before I asked the main question? Uh, well, I pastored for 13 years. Okay, so, but you were born well, I was in it. born in Adventist, So yeah. what, what, how old were you when you actually came out of the Seventh-day oh, Adventist my. church? Um, 40-something, I guess. Okay, so yeah. you were in the Seventh-day Adventist religion for over 40 years. Oh, yeah. Okay, now during that time, were you aware of what you're reading well, right now? Yeah, I, I was, and, and I had a hard time trying to fit it together, but I feel well, it's got to be truth, so I, it's just my lack of understanding. Oh, is that how you yeah. justify it? Yeah. See, I was curious how a Seventh-day Adventist, if he's aware of these things you're bringing up, how he dealt with that. Well, uh, when I get a little further in here, I'll, I'll, I'll give some illustrations, okay? Thank you. She says, many shepherds, this would be pastors, of the flock who professed to love Jesus said they had no opposition to the preaching of Christ's coming, but they objected to a definite time. Now, should they have objected to a definite time? Absolutely. <laughs> Christ said, we don't know the day or the hour. Ministers who would not accept this saving message themselves hindered those who would have received it, and the blood of souls is upon them. Preachers and people joined to oppose this message from heaven. Oh, she says... Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects of our characters and to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. How would you like that? So, uh, so your own works, <coughs> according to her, are going to justify by you cleansing yeah. yourself. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit until we break every yoke that binds us to our objectionable traits of character. <laughs> That's about it, as anti-biblical as you can get when you try to justify your own works in light of the righteousness of Christ alone. Yep. The original Adventist gospel was this, that Christ would come in 1843. It was the truth. It was a testing point. It was a saving message. It was a message from heaven. And pastors who rejected this date setting had the blood of souls on them. Now, that's a false gospel, clear as can be. Now, SDAs, this is number three now. SDAs had many errors, okay, to mm -hmm. start with. Their whole foundation was error. SDAs still claim to be the remnant church of Bible prophecy, the one true church. And here's their statement. <clears throat> and now, we're going to spend some time on this. Look, look at it carefully. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. We would agree with that, mm -hmm. okay? But in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy. Now, behind that, she's talking about Sunday worship and those who believe that the dead go to heaven. That's, that's mm -hmm. the widespread apostasy. A remnant has been called out. Called out of what? Called out of the universal church. Mm -hmm. Okay? To keep the commandments of God. By that, she means the Seventh-day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour. October 22, 1844, <laughs> okay. Proclaims salvation through Christ, heralds the approach of his second advent. This proclamation symbolizes the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven. That's the investigative judgment, okay. And results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Now notice, every believer is called to have a part in this a personal part in this worldwide witness. Now, if you look at this and study it, this gives them the mandate to proselytize other Christians. Mm -hmm. They're in the universal church. And she says, what we have to do is go in with our, our message of new truth and pull them out of the universal church into this worldwide witness mm -hmm. who believe on the Sabbath. They, we, don't, we believe in soul sleep. And we believe that we're the only true church, and the investigative judgment's going on. That's, mm -hmm. that's the whole, the whole uh, you might say, um, uh, dynamic of Seventh-day Adventism, mm -hmm. okay? Now, <clears throat> number four. So they're the only true church. Number four, SDAs teach that the Seventh-day Sabbath is the seal of God, which is the separating wall between believers and unbelievers. Separating wall. 
Is that pretty clear? <laughs> the separating wall. The seal yeah. of God. If, if you ask a Seventh-day Adventist, can somebody uh, be saved who keeps Sunday? They will say, well, sure. But once you know the truth about the Sabbath mm -hmm. and then reject it, then you'll be lost. Now, that's interesting in itself because... But if you're ignorant of it, you're okay. But if you're understanding of it, all of a sudden, the whole rules of the, of the game change. Yep. Okay, let's, let's look at some of her quotes. And again, she's an authoritative source of truth. Great Controversy, mm -hmm. page 605. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. Pretty clear. That's right. <clears throat> the soul who keeps the Sabbath is stamped with the seal of God's government. You talk about the seal, mean mm -hmm. stamped, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and he must not dishonor this sign. By closely examining the Word of God, we may know whether we have the king's mark, whether we have been chosen and set apart to honor God. God will never, never allow any man to pass through the pearly gates of the city of God who does not bear the signet of the faithful, his government mark. <laughs> now, yeah. did you read that? Yes, I did. She says, and it's in Medical Ministry, page 123, God will never, never allow anyone to pass through the holy gates, the, 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 pearly, gates, gates. the pearly gates, okay, yeah. <laughs> who does not keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That's pretty clear. Now, that's why I'm curious as to how a lot of these, like you just mentioned a minute ago, a seven-day Adventist can justify someone who doesn't do it and say, well, you're okay. Well, you don't, you don't know about it yet. See, that's, that's what they want to oh, do. Oh, but is, if, they, if they were to like read some of this LMG White stuff and know about it, all of a sudden now they're cursed if they still refuse yeah. to believe it. Yeah, Ellen White says that, okay. I don't have that quote in here, but she says that once we believe in the Sabbath, if we reject the Sabbath, we will go on to reject uh, God and finally become an atheist. Oh, okay. So she programs, and she says the same about her own writings, she programs people that when they leave Adventism, they will become agnostics. Mm -hmm. Well, see, you just proved that she's a false prophet because that didn't happen to you. No, but it's happened, <laughs> the, the, the bad part of it is it's happened to oh, thousands that's right. of them. It yeah. is. It that is. was one reason but I wrote one of everyone. my books. No, not mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is another one, and, and, and Adventists ought to listen to this. If you're an Adventist watching this, listen carefully to what Ellen White says. God requires that the holy day, His holy day, that's the Sabbath, be as sacredly observed now as in the time of Israel. The command given to the Hebrews should be regarded by all Christians as an injunction from Jehovah to them. In other words, Ellen White says we need to keep the Sabbath as taught in Exodus. And it says, uh, as is in the time of Israel, yeah, absolutely. not all of the time yeah. of it. So yeah. you go right back in the Old Testament. Yeah. And there's no, no Seventh-day Adventist that keeps the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have them here, mm -hmm. but Ellen White has page after page after page of, of new rules for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, new rules besides the oh, Old besides Testament? Oh, besides it. Yeah, you can't, you can't ride in cars. You need to put all the magazines out of sight. You can't, you can't take a bath on Sabbath. Uh, you're not supposed to shave Sabbath morning. Uh, one of her sons uh, only got one shoe polished before mm -hmm. sundown, and he had to go to church with one shoe polished and one shoe not polished. Yeah. Um, on and on, yeah. And she says, um, <clears throat> child, parents who let their children play outside or inside, uh, inside of doors on the Sabbath are Sabbath violators. Now, so if you have small children playing, then you're in violation of the Sabbath. Now, this brings a point uh, that says, and I'm reading what she said there, as in the time of Israel, but the violators of the Sabbath keeping, like someone picking up sticks on, right. on the Sabbath, were killed. Now, how can, <laughs> how can you, I don't think I've heard of any Seventh-day Adventist who found another Seventh-day Adventist not keeping the Sabbath, as in the time of Israel, killing another Seventh-day Adventist for, for breaking the Sabbath. See, that's the problem with the Sabbath. You can't keep it. And the Jews have said, if we ever keep the Sabbath, the Messiah will come. Oh, yeah. They've never kept it. That's right. So, uh, in fact, that's one thing that Paul was very adamant about in the New Testament, just trying to prove, especially in Romans, nobody can keep it. 
Okay, SDA's, that's, that's number four. Here's number five. SDA's teach that Sunday worship is or will become the mark of the beast. Okay, now Sabbath, we said, was the seal of God, and you've got mm -hmm. to keep the Sabbath to get in. Okay, here's a statement from her. <clears throat> the sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath. We just said that. The Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite, the observance of the first day of the week. Now, I have a friend uh, who's down in Jamaica. I think you know who he is. Uh, yes. And he emailed me and said the Adventists had a bunch of tent meetings down there, evangelistic meetings, mm -hmm. and they're going around to other Christians and saying, you got the mark of the beast. You got the mark mm -hmm. of the beast because you worship on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they don't do that, you know, in your face here in the United States, but they do it in their evangelistic series very subtly, mm -hmm. you know, so... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I've seen some of their revelation, revelation seminars and things that they do around here in this country. Now, the Adventist Church is distributing over a hundred million copies of Ellen White's Great Controversy. Actually, it's a summary of that book. Some of them are full, some of them are summaries called The Great Hope. But this book, The Great Controversy, is, is uh, Ellen White said it was her favorite book, and it's the one that is very... Uh, it used to be one of my favorite books, I mean, when I was an Adventist. It was, mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a thrilling, terrifying uh, statement of what's going to take place in the last days. Mm -hmm. That there's going to be a Sunday law, first a national Sunday law, then there's going to be a universal Sunday law. And the, day, and the day will come when they say that anybody who's keeping the Sabbath is to be put to death. Mm -hmm. So Adventists are taught that they have to be willing to die for the Sabbath rather than worship on Sunday. Okay, it's terrifying. Rather than die for Christ, exactly. die for the Sabbath. You got it. Okay. And so that's, you know, they're, they're giving, uh, you know, 100 million copies of this away. It's over that much. Okay, number six. SDAs teach that Daniel 8.14 refers to October 22, 1844, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and the beginning of the investigative judgment. Now, I'm going to give another presentation on this, but just a little introduction here. This is actually the central pillar of Adventist theology, even though the Sabbath is considered the most important doctrine. And this is what Dan uh, Daniel 8.14 says, And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. It's a, it's a very difficult text, and it's apocalyptic text, but that's the key text of Adventism. Now, what they've done with this text, because this was the very text that William Miller used to prove Christ was coming in 1843. Mm -hmm. So here's the history of this, and it's fascinating. First, they predicted Christ would come in 1843. He didn't. They revised it. Uh, it was kind of an interesting story. Uh, I think it was uh, Samuel Snow came to one of their camp meetings and said, Oh, I've got new light. Christ is coming instead of 1843. It's 18, uh, October 22, 1844. And it electrified them. And they just they were full of uh, fanaticism, okay? Mm. And they did it by saying that, well, Christ is going to cleanse the sanctuary. And, and it they didn't know it was the earthly sanctuary that Antiochus Epiphanes destroyed. Mm -hmm. Rather, they thought, well, it's the, it's the other sanctuary. It must be Leviticus 16. So they said, sanctuary there, sanctuary there, cleansing must be the Day of Atonement, must be the, the, the scapegoat and all that. And so they, they took words that didn't mean the same thing, and they said, well, the Day of Atonement is going to be on October 22, therefore Christ is coming at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a roundabout way to do it, and I studied all that thoroughly. So that's the second, first you know, it's interesting. There's a bestseller back in, in Christian bookstores back in 1988. And, uh, 88 Reasons? And 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 1988. And then when that didn't happen, the guy came out with another bestseller in the Christian bookstores the next year called 89 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1989. And here I'm seeing 1843 then. Yeah. Oh, well, that didn't work. Let's try the next year. So now the third one was, this was transformed into the shut door of mercy. Let me explain how this works. They took the parable in Matthew of the, of the virgins, the 12 virgins, okay? Mm -hmm. And they thought that when Christ went into the new phase of ministry in heaven, he mm -hmm. shut the door. Mm -hmm. So they put that onto the, you know, the, the parable of the, of the 12 virgins. Yeah, that's in Matthew they 25. Had, yeah, they had gone into the marriage feast mm -hmm. and shut the door. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't know about that, what they, you know, what their new theology, and you mm -hmm. wanted to get it, the door was shut. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And Ellen White, <clears throat> actually there's three things here in the book Culty Doctrine, you'll see it under Swinging Door. Mm -hmm. They believe that the door is shut from anybody who didn't believe like they did. There was no hope of salvation for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Then after a few years or uh, some period of time, they gave it up. Then Ellen White had visions again that the shut door was still valid. Mm -hmm. And it was in one of her first visions. And it's really interesting, in the book uh, Early Writings, they have a copy of her vision, and there's nothing about the shut door in it. Why? Because they left out a sentence that taught the shut door. But in the preface to the book, they say nothing's been left out, any changes were made under, under the author's eye. Deception. Well, it's just like the Mormon church. They came out with their 1830 Book of Mormon, uh -huh. but over the last hundred years or so, they made over 6,000 changes in it. Uh, you know, so a lot of these cult groups, because they don't have the truth to begin with, you know, it's sort of like if you lie about something and you tell other people, you have to remember your lie. But if you're telling the truth, it's easy to remember. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they, they just do what most most cults do, which is just to change things up. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I could spend more time on it, but I, I shouldn't, I guess. That at one time, Ellen White said, anybody that has a copy of this, please return it to us. Somehow we've lost it, you know. <laughs> so she could and, destroy and, the evidence. Exactly. <laughs> and then they finally found another, one of them had a copy. And I didn't even know about this uh -huh. when I was a pastor. This uh -huh. all came after I left Adventism. I found out about it. In fact, the, Mu the Muslims did the same thing. One of their caliphs, uh, Uthman, I think it was, uh, because they were coming up with different Qurans mm -hmm. that were supposedly written, you know, uh, in heaven and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but they, they were contradicting each other. So Uthman, who was going to do a, a, a uniform version of the, of the Quran, had everybody turn in their, their old Qurans and things that contradicted each other, had them burned. Of course, <laughs> it's like anything, though. You can't always get rid of all the yeah, evidence. Yeah. And so this is just this old hat yeah. stuff. Okay. Okay, then this is the fourth reinterpret. They morphed, morphed this into the investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. So now they, they, they gave up the shut door and they gave it up for two reasons. One is that they had kids born after the 1844 right. and they had to get their kids in. So the way they could do it was just forget about the shut door. And mm -hmm. The way they did it, they renamed the door. <laughs> well, they, they redefined renamed it. The in, 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 instead of, well, it sounds funny, but it's, <laughs> it is, it's tragic. Instead of being the door of the 12 virgins, okay, that door, uh -huh. they moved it to the door in Revelation. Okay. Uh, behold, there is an open door. Mm -hmm. and so they said, God closed one door and opened another door. So right. they got that. Thing. Now, the investigative judgment, that's a huge, uh, huge thing that I have a whole presentation on. Yes. Now, not all, but many now say that God is the one being judged. And he's the one on trial. And I'll get to this when we get to the, some of the, the, uh, right. the, the, the teachings of Adventism. Now, all the while, never admitting past error and claiming only to be the true church. They have actually contradicted themselves exactly opposite to what they believed before, but they've mm -hmm. never admitted error. Mm -hmm. Now this is what uh, Dr. Barnhouse, who's the editor of Attorney, yes, yes. he visited with the Adventists, you know. And, he and also worked with uh, Walter Mark? Yes, yes. Okay. And this is what he said, the sanctuary doctrine is to me the most colossal, psychological, face-saving phenomenon in the religious history. We personally do not believe that there's even a suspicion of a verse in Scripture to sustain such a peculiar position, and we further believe that any effort to establish it is stale, flat, and unprofitable. It is unimportant and almost naive. Mm -hmm. Now, number seven, mm -hmm. Adventists promote the Clear Word Bible. Like my original Bible, it said Clear Word Bible, now it's just called the Clear Word. Mm -hmm. And this was written by a PhD, Doctor of Theology, mm -hmm. one, of our, one of our schools, one of the Adventist schools, Southern Missionary College, okay, at that time was university. And it's proclaimed the most corrupt Bible ever printed by a self-proclaimed Christian organization, much more so than Jehovah Witness Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, this is the picture of, there's, it comes in all kinds of bindings, mm -hmm. and if you want to go to Review and Herald website, that's her publishing, and search on Clear Word, you'll, you'll see all this. There's Clear Word for kids, there's Easy English Clear Word. Mm -hmm. They use the Easy English Clear Word in third world countries to teach English, mm -hmm. and they say, what better way to, to teach English than through the Word of God? So Seventh-day Adventists, uh, <coughs> I know in our previous discussions, you mentioned something about uh, they call it like a paraphrase, or, or they're trying to back off from it being like the Bible itself. Yes. Uh, but 
for most Seventh Day Adventists, don't they just look at the clear word translation as the Bible? Is that their Bible? Or how well, do they look it, at it? it depends. Uh, and I hate to say this, but my mother, uh, she remained a Seventh Day Adventist to her dying day. Mm -hmm. And the thing that tore my heart up more than anything else, she wouldn't let me read to her right before she died. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read her from the New American Bible. And uh, I told her not to, to study the clear word, but in her things we found the clear word and she had read every page because every page had read underlinings like she always did. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of people use it, some people don't. Some mm -hmm. people hate it and know it's bad. Other people rely, and it's called the beloved paraphrase. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's advertised. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a Seventh-day Adventist Bible. They don't call it a Seventh-day Adventist Bible, but it is. Mm -hmm. So it's... They, they and, and they're actively promoting it among their people. Uh, well, they advertise it in their Sabbath school lessons. Right. At least they did. Now, what I'm going to read now was on the preface, or I should say on the flyleaf of the Bible that I originally bought. Okay, mm -hmm. this was some years ago. This was in uh, the 90s I bought it. This is what it says. Now listen carefully and, s and you'll see what a wonderful Bible this is. For everyone who hungers for a clearer understanding of God's Word and a richer devotional life, imagine how much more you would get out of the Bible if the meaning of every passage was crystal clear. <laughs> the Clear Word Bible lets the power of ancient texts come through today. The result of this careful paraphrasing, note that, is that you not only find more understanding in reading the Bible, you find more joy as the meaning of Scripture becomes more transparent. Every text is phrased to make its original meaning as plain as possible to a modern reader. Now, did, did you get all that? Okay. Well, yep, they're making it very plain that they're saying their <clears throat> translation is going to make everything crystal clear to the closest to what the Bible is really trying to tell you. Exactly. Even the ancient text. Exactly. Now, this text is the one that caused me to write Cultic Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And I had studied it, and as I mentioned in one of the other presentations, I was in an Adventist doctor's, uh, a medical doctor's home, and he brought the clear word out and said, this is the most reliable trans uh, translation, and read this. Daniel 8.14 says, this is at the New American Standard Bible, and he said unto me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be restored. Then he said to him, after 2300 prophetic days, or 2300 years, God will step in, proclaim the truth about himself, and restore the ministry of the sanctuary in heaven to its rightful place. This is when the judgment will begin, of which the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary was a type. Now, is there anything added there? <laughs> I mean, they've taken the whole Adventist theology and the writings of Ellen White and stuck it in there. And you notice, it's in the quotes from the angel. Exactly. They, did, they didn't even, you know, even the Jehovah's Witnesses in their faulty and corrupt translation called the New World Translation, uh -huh. will at least put, uh, well, like, they weren't doing it at first, but when they got caught on it, they started at least putting brackets around some of the stuff they added in. Yeah. But at first they were doing it just like yeah. the Seventh-day Adventists in their translation. Uh, okay. But I, I couldn't help but laugh, though, when you put that chart up, when you see the original text, and then you see the Seventh-day Adventists of the same text, and you get like five times <laughs> the verbiage, you know something's, something's smelly in Denmark. Yeah. I took um, a, a, a class on, on text transmission called Lower Textual Criticism. You probably know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. And one of the rules for finding the original text is, is usually the shortest is, is more accurate because the, somebody translating right, the right. text would like to make Copy. it, explain it, you know, and exactly. they want to make it bigger. Exactly. So. Okay, now here's Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The clear word. <laughs> Don't be afraid that you might be killed. They can kill your body, but not your spirit, or your loyalty to me. Now, if there's something to be concerned about, it's that you don't lose faith in God. It changes soul to spirit, which are different Greek words. It deletes, able to destroy both soul and body in hell, and changes hell to don't lose faith in God. That's right. Now, is that a, a, uh, an accurate translation? They're tampering with the Word of God. They're Absolutely. violating the scriptures. Uh, 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 Revelation 22, do not add to or take away from the Word of God, right. or God will add to him the plagues. And uh, I fear, looking at this, I'm fearing for 
whoever did this. Uh, you were saying it was that THD guy, yeah. but yeah. but I think he's in a heap of trouble with the Lord. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same. Now, why did they do that? Because they don't believe in hell. So they just right. take they just take hell out of the pro out right. of the text. That's the easy way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Jude nine. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now what does the clear word say? In contrast with these ungodly men is the Lord Jesus Christ also called Michael the archangel, in charge of the entire angelic host, when he was challenged by Satan about his intention to resurrect Moses. Now, it says nothing about resurrecting That's right. Moses. That's right. And if it would have been Christ, he wouldn't have said, The Lord rebuke you. That's right. Only an angel would say that to refer to somebody else as Lord. Exactly. And it equates Christ with Michael the archangel. Now, why does he do that? Because that was done in early Adventism, right. and Ellen White That's right. mentions that. So he wants to put it in the clear word. So once again, he's adding to the Word of God, putting in words that were never there in the original text. Right. Uh, so that undermines the deity of Christ. Amen. Okay. Now, Revelation 1.10, you can probably guess what this one is. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, what does the clear word say? One Sabbath morning, when I had gone to the rocky island shore to meditate and worship, I suddenly heard behind me the sound as loud as a trumpet. Uh -huh. Now, notice what he does. He takes the Lord's day, and there are animated saying that that mean refers to the Sabbath, uh -huh. which it doesn't, okay? Uh -huh. And... <clears throat> And he wants to make it like John is, you know, on the Isle of Patmos. So one Sabbath morning, he gets out and he wants to meditate out by the rocky shore. Mm -hmm. He's keeping Sabbath. <laughs> so what they have done, they've taken that, that he, he just mentions it. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. And early Christian church, the Lord's Day referred to Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, and turns it into Sabbath theology. Well, it kind of reminds me, too, of uh, there's another group that... Uh, a Seventh-day Adventist guy started uh, this thing about using a King James Bible only, in no other translation. No. And it was a Seventh-day Adventist guy back in the uh, 1930s. We've got some videos on this on YouTube. But anyway, because there was a verse that the Seventh-day Adventists like to use in the King James that right. weren't in some of the other translations. Daniel 814, cleansed. Right. Instead they wanted to keep... The, he came up with something saying, well, you can only use it. See, they didn't have a clear word back in 1930. No, no. So he came up with this doctrine of, well, you just got to use a King James, any other translations of the devil and, and, and things of that nature. And it started this whole movement of where you got to use a King James only or else your translations of the devil, you know. <laughs> all, the, all the early Adventist uh, evangelistic series uh, I went to, they always would give away a, to the, to the new people, a King James Bible. Right, right. Because it's easier to prove Adventist doctrine. Right, from. right. And that's yeah. exactly why this guy okay. started this King James only thing. And you know what's interesting? The, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons mm. both published King James Bibles yeah, also yeah. until, you know, they've done their thing. Go, go ahead. Okay, now 2 Corinthians 5.21, that is, that's a key text on the gospel, the substitution of Christ, okay. Mm -hmm. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Here Christ is our substitute. Mm -hmm. He takes our sin and He accounts to us His righteousness. We're righteous only in Him, okay? Mm -hmm. Now notice what He did here. For God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now notice carefully. <clears throat> so that He might pour Christ's righteousness into us so that we could become more like God changes imputed righteousness to imparted righteousness, right. changes Christ as our substitute to Christ as our example. And that's basically Catholic theology, the idea that it's, it's the infused yeah. grace right, right, that right. makes us right before God. Right. And it reminds me also of the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses where they <coughs> change certain aspects similar to what he's doing here in passages of the Bible because it doesn't fit with their theology. So right. they have to add words into the text to try to make it sound like Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Right. Okay, now they have a remnant Bible. Now what is that? It is a, uh, based upon the King James Version or mm -hmm. the, the New King James. You mm -hmm. can get a choice, okay? Yeah, yeah, now yeah. what is a remnant Bible? Here's what it says. This is, I get this from their website. Yeah. 
For the first time ever, the masterful commentary of Ellen G. White is now included alongside the King James Version or the New King James Version of the Bible. You'll also find a complete array of other unique Bible study aids, such as a complete set of chain reference Bible studies. Here a little in there, a little proof texting. Mm -hmm. And a detailed sections on prophetic symbols uh, of the prophecy of Daniel and the awesome uh, inspiring sanctuary service. Okay, mm -hmm. so what they're doing is, here's a new Bible, but it has all of the Adventist, you know, you can follow the Adventist uh, teachings by the proof text right, right. and uh, so on. Now, for a richer, more in-depth Bible study experience and for more effective soul-winning resource, you can't do any better than the new remnant Bible study. Order today. See, and they like the King James anyway before, and right. now they can add all their little notes right. in there to right. pervert, the, pervert the doctrine anyway. So. There's two other Bibles they have, but I'm going to skip those for now. Number eight, SDAs teach soul sleep. That is, the dead persons do not exist. And those who believe the righteous dead go to be with the Lord at death are under the deceptions of Satan. Now, it's important to understand what soul sleep can lead to. Adventists believe that the Hebrew and Greek words ruah and uh, pneuma, which can be translated either spirit or breath, depending on the context, always equaled breath. And that's a big mistake, okay? Second, they define a soul as a breather. And they go to Genesis 1-1, where God formed man out of the dusty earth and breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Now, that breath he believed, breathed in him was more than air, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but that's how, what they define a soul as. Now, notice that it's going to have some far-reaching consequences, but a soul is a breather. And Adventists believe that there is no such thing as a human spirit. Where the Bible talks about soul and spirit, and body, soul, and spirit, over a triune type uh, person, Adventists see no human spirit. Now, death to them is annihilation. However, they don't look at it like that. They say they're just sleeping in the grave. Uh, well, if when the body, when the breath leaves the body, um, there's nothing because the soul is a breather. So if there's no breather, there's no soul, and the body deteriorates in death. Resurrection is a recreation. So between death and the second coming, there is no person. Mm -hmm. There's no ontological connection. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about two things here. First of all, I'm going to ask, what good is it to me here to know that when I die, God will create somebody up there, even if it has my thoughts in it, it's not me, you see, because it's somebody new. Mm -hmm. So that creates a real problem, but that's only the beginning of the problems. Soul sleep and abortion. I want to spend a little time on this, and we may have some documentation for you more than I have right here. Originally, Adventists were pro-life. Ellen White and the early leaders did not believe in abortion. But then, without going into all the details, the hospitals, uh, Castle Memorial, for example, in Hawaii, where our son lives, by the way. And that is a Seventh-day Adventist yes. hospital. Okay. They said that they were a, a complete hospital, would do all, you know, anything for needed for health. Well, some of the other doctors came in and wanted to do abortions, and that led to some, uh, some studies and so on. But to make a long story short, Adventists are very pro-abortion, okay? They're not pro-life. Uh, <clears throat> and unknown to many people, one of the physicians that graduated from uh, Loma Linda University started a chain of abortion clinics. And he was the one that introduced what they called uh, assembly line abortions. And he said that over the 10 years that he owned the practice, he figured that he did uh, a quarter of a million of abortions, 250,000. No, when abortions. you mentioned Loma and Linda, that's also Seventh Day Adventist. Absolutely, it, and, and it's a good medical. Yes, and it's a good medical school. They have a dental school there too. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And it's interesting or providential or what, and I, I'm not going to say it was the Lord that did this, but anyway, it's interesting. He sold it to another uh, group, Adventist owned, and it is said that they now do more abortions in the Adventist owned uh, clinics than Planned Parenthood. Now, this is not the Adventist denomination, it's a business person who's an Adventist. Mm. And <coughs> uh, an event that happened. Uh, this one family that were connected to this abortion group were in an airplane, and I believe it was in New Mexico, I forget just where it was, but it crashed into a graveyard, and right where they crashed, there was a, a monument uh, to aborted children who were unborn. Mm. And mm. So you're, from the chart that people are looking at right now at home on their screen, uh, you've got this step-by-step -step analysis of soul sleep and in the end what the chart leads to what soul sleep has led to in this case with Seventh-day Adventists is abortion. And that's right and I remember when I was still a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and the abortion issue came up I thought well a soul is not a, a, a breather and, a, a, until it's a breather so I thought well maybe it'll be okay. Yeah, and it's so that's the doctrine. Yeah so what I'm saying is that Doctrine is more than just a hard statement of, of what you believe. It works its way out in life. Mm -hmm. And this soul sleep is, uh, well, if you believe in abortion. Um, well, we know, I've, uh, we've got a video on abortion on our YouTube channel. Anyone that wants to check it out, go to our YouTube channel, See Answers TV. And uh, basically the easiest way to find it, you can do a search on abortion, find our video. But when you go with ch early church history, and the Bible teachings, right. you, you find abortion totally condemned Absolutely. by God. And so uh, to, to be pro-abortion is to be not only uh, anti-biblical, but to uh, go against church history itself. Yeah, Paul says, the Lord set me apart when? Before birth. Amen. Well, look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. He said, I set you apart to be a prophet. And uh, look at Mary. You know, yeah. Mary and, and, Luke and Christ. Chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse right. 15, you've got John, uh, the, the, uh, John the Baptist right. right there in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, I think it is, where he's, he's, he's leaping, leaping for joy. Up. Yep. That's right. <laughs> and he gets word uh, that uh, Mary's going to have this right. child. Right. <laughs> Some of the anti-gospel teachings of Adventism, well, we've looked at some of them. This is just a quick little review here. Miller's truth, message from heaven, saving message. Ellen White says you should never know you're saved. Why? Because you never know. Because are you going to remain faithful? And if you don't, you're going to fall away. Mm -hmm. And if your name hasn't come up in judgment, how do you know? Now, it's really interesting, coming back to the state of the dead. Uh, in the very early days of Adventism, maybe this is even before the church was formed, I don't have the exact dates for this, but Ellen White said that she saw some of the people that died in heaven. She said she saw good old Noah and Abraham and uh, I forget several others in heaven mm -hmm. and some of the people that were died just currently. Mm -hmm. But then when they took the uh, investigative judgment doctrine on, mm -hmm. they realized they couldn't be in heaven because they hadn't come up in judgment. <laughs> So they had to pull them back out of heaven and put them back in the grave. <laughs> and we've already read that only those who keep the Sabbath will be saved. No meat eating for those at the second coming. Did you know that? <laughs> Ellen White says that those who are translated to think raptured uh, mm -hmm. will have given up the use of flesh foods. And why that is, you need to understand, because she says that meat eating uh, intensifies our animal passions and for her animal passions, she even says we have animal passions and uh, organs in the brain, which mm -hmm. is interesting is sexual stimulation. Right. And so if you're going to be ready for the second coming, you've got to be perfect, and so you've got to give up eating meat so you don't have too many sexual stimulations. Okay, she says we must give perfect obedience before God's promises will be fulfilled to us. And then she talks about perfection necessary for the last generation. I'll deal with now, that. What, are you going to deal with that one? Because I want yeah. to ask about perfection. What no, is we'll deal with that a little All bit right. later. Okay. These are now what I'm going to do are these are Gospels, quote unquote, that are now being taught in Adventism. And Adventism is, is splintering into several different groups right now. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say, do Adventists believe that, you have to clarify what group of Adventists believe what. So I'm going to go through this. Okay, there are six 
conflicting, you might say, or different gospels. First, there's the gospel of example, and this is, this is the traditional Adventist gospel. The Christ came down and proved that man can keep the law. And they say he used no power that we may not have. So if Christ came down, and they even say he had a sinful nature. They say Jesus had Ellen a White says that at one place, another place she had a, sinful, a sinless nature. She's confused on it. Depends on what she's dealing with. Okay. But they say that Christ came down and proved that we could keep the law. But Satan, they say, has charged that man cannot keep God's law. He said, God, you must have given Christ a little extra power. Let's see a group of people keep it, because I think you gave them a too hard of a law. That's kind of the, the idea of Adventism. And to settle Satan's charges, Christ is waiting for a group of people who will perfectly keep the law and thus answer Satan's charge. <laughs> and the quote goes something like this, uh, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then Christ will come to save his own. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people. We know that's never happened. It's never going to happen. Okay. <laughs> so Adventists see this is their assignment. They're looking for the remnant, which is a group of Adventists who will perfectly keep the law, and that will help answer the charges that Satan has made against God. Do they admit that any of them have ever done it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you two people I've met that say they were without sin, but I'm not going to oh, do okay. it. So okay, then there's the feast-keeping gospel. Now, this is a small group within Adventism. It was, it was centered around uh, Bakersfield, California, but it's grown out from there. I don't know how many believe this. And a lot of the, you're familiar with the Messianic uh, group right now that, that are keeping all the old Torah, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, say so these kind of go together. They're Adventists moving that direction. Yeah. They keep all the holy days and not just the Seventh-day Sabbath. Some are moving into the Messianic group, all the laws of Torah, men wearing beards, and that it whole thing. reminds me of the Hebrews roots movement that's going yeah. on. And I, I'm dealing with these by uh, email. I'm dealing back and forth with yeah. one. It's really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> now, say so that's the second one was the feast-keeping gospel, which is very similar to the front one, except they keep all the Torah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you have the great controversy gospel. And this one is, Satan has charged before the angels and unfallen worlds that God says, serve me or I'll torture you. To answer Satan's charges, God has to prove his character of love, that he's not going to punish anyone ever. Okay? <laughs> and this was taught in the Loma Linda area by the chairman of the Department of Religion mm -hmm. that I met with for five hours trying to get some answers. Mm -hmm. Now, it downplays, and some even reject blood atonement. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yep. They reject Christ as our substitute. The gospel is understanding the loving character of God and developing sufficient knowledge and character to be safe to save. Almost sounds like uh, he, he got some uh, liberal theology at one of these yeah, that's seminaries. Where they, <laughs> that's where they did, yeah. Okay. Now, then there's the 88 gospel, the 1888 gospel. Now, what is that? Before 1888, the gospel was not, righteousness by faith was never mentioned. Mm -hmm. Almost nothing about faith in Christ. It was all obedience to the Ten Commandment law, or the shut door, or the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so in 88, two men by the name of Jones and Wagner came up, and they had a, a, a big conference on righteousness by faith. But they're, and, and the church pretty well rejected them. But this is not quite right either because it equates the righteousness of the law with the righteousness of faith, which we saw earlier were different. Mm -hmm. And it confuses imparted and imputed righteousness, okay? That if you're justified by faith, you can really be righteous. So it, it moves it a little step further than the gospel. Now another gospel of progressive pluralism. What is that? Mm -hmm. These are real liberal people, mostly again in the, in the higher echelons of uh, scholarship mm -hmm. uh, in the Loma Linda area. They disregard all the conflicting and contradictory teachings of Adventism and put community over theology. Some have said that Adventism has more in common with Islam and Judaism than Christianity. Some say Adventism should be seen as a separate world religion. Now this is the cutting edge of the liberal group mm -hmm. in, in Adventism. Well, plus that first point you <coughs> had there uh, kind of ties in with the social Gospel yeah, at the yeah. same time. So. 
And then there are some that believe in the Pauline gospel of justification by faith, but they don't renounce the errors of Adventism. So this puts them in a terrible, and I've talked to a lot of the pastors like this, they're compromised. Mm -hmm. They don't believe Adventism, but they're, and they may not preach the investigative judgment. They not, may not read Ellen, uh, preach Ellen but White. But they draw their paychecks, and they, they don't want to. And their tithe goes to support all and that. their retirement see. and all that yeah, kind of stuff. right. Okay, now, here's a, um, a diagram that I made to help people understand the difference between Adventist theology and evangelical theology. And so let me explain this very carefully. There's a chart that has red bars, okay? This is the evangelical gospel. The red bars represent the imputed righteousness of Christ that we have the moment we're born again. Mm -hmm. NB right. means born again, okay? Mm -hmm. So from that time on, the Christian life, we are righteous because of Christ's righteousness in Him, okay? Mm -hmm. The white represents imputed righteousness. Now, all of us who have been born again will want to do God's will. The Holy Spirit will work out in us a certain amount of righteousness. It's nothing to compare to Christ's righteousness, mm -hmm. but it we should see ourselves developing in righteousness, That's okay? Right. But we don't see ourselves becoming perfect. Exactly. And in the second coming, we're still relying on, on right. God's righteousness, which yeah. is in Jesus Christ. While we're Christ. in this flesh, right. we're, never, we're never going to be sinlessly perfect. No. <laughs> And, 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 they, and that's, that's a clear Bible text. If anyone right. says he's without sin, he lies. That's okay. exactly right. Okay, now compare this now to the Adventist gospel. And there's a big difference. First of all, they don't speak of the new birth. They speak of conversion to the truth. Mm. Here you'll see the red lines, again, represent imputed righteousness. So if you're really mm. converted, you do believe that Christ's righteousness covers you. He sees our effort, and so it makes up for the difference. Mm. So the goal of Adventism, they won't say it in this many words, but this is the goal, is to be able to live without having to rely on Christ's imputed righteousness. Wow. So the way it works is that Adventists want to develop sanctification. Then this LR stands for latter rain. Mm -hmm. And at some time in the future, there's going to be a great latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not speaking in tongues, which they're totally against. And... Uh, <clears throat> and not, I'm not promoting it either. I'm just saying that they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. That suddenly, uh, if we fully surrender our lives to Him, mm -hmm. that we will be able to advance in righteousness very rapidly mm -hmm. up to the close of probation. Now, CP means the close of probation. Mm -hmm. Ellen White uses probation a thousand times or more. Mm -hmm. The Bible never uses it once. Right. Another writer uses probation. Do you know who it is? Can't think of it offhand. Joseph Smith. Oh, that's right. Okay. That's right. Now, mm. there's a time between the close of probation, an unknown time, and the second coming, where the righteous Adventists, still in their human state, will have to live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Mm -hmm. Try that on. Oh, boy. That is, that is about as different a gospel as you can get. Absolutely. And that's, that's the whole framework of Adventism. Now... Adventists still use deceptive practices. They refuse to admit past error. They continue to teach error. They still use questionable ethics. They still condemn those who expose SDA errors. And who do you suppose uh, one of their <laughs> key persons are? I think I'm sitting next to a target right here. <laughs> when, we were, when we were on our 09 trip, uh, we stopped at many places like Andrews University. Uh -huh. uh, uh, right close, okay. Uh -huh. But every, and, and, and the, the conference sent out notification to all the churches hold meetings exactly the same time they're holding meetings uh -huh. and don't let the people go to hear us <laughs> okay so um, well you know it's interesting in my case uh the jehovah's witnesses in austin texas uh said that told all their people in town that i was an evil slave uh, of the <laughs> devil you know sure. and i'll never forget this one jehovah's witness lady came up to my door one day and so i was getting into a conversation with her and all of a sudden her husband comes up and starts pulling her away from the doors and she didn't understand why you know and he has to kind of tell her while i'm standing there <laughs> he's, he's can't you see in the book he's an evil slave he's an evil slave and yeah. she he dragged her but, away yeah. so. okay <laughs> okay this is what my um ministerial secretary told me i think i may have mentioned this in another presentation dale we both know the doctrine's wrong but it's not our fault and we can't do anything about it 
We're told to go outside and get a job outside the church. Just do what you can with a clear conscience. Don't make any waves, and you will be fine. Mm -hmm. I have personally talked with the president of a conference. I won't mention which one because it was in confidence. Mm -hmm. I personally talked with an evangelist. I personally talked with a editor of a large, very important journal in Adventism mm -hmm. and ask them point blank, do you believe Ellen White for doctrine? No. Do you believe the tablet of the seal of God? No. Do you believe Sunday is a mark of the beast? No. Do you believe 1844 in the investigative judgment? No. Mm -hmm. I said, how can you do this? Mm -hmm. The conference president, I said, how in the world can you do this? He says, well, I don't force my men to teach these things. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why don't you change? He says, it'll never happen. The one that, the editor of the magazine, I asked him the same questions. He responded. I said, what's going on? How can you stay in there? He says, well, Adventists don't understand the gospel. And I said, do you understand what you just said? Adventists have 66 books. Now, it's interesting that Ellen White wrote 66 mm -hmm. books, too. Oh, Remember right? the 66 yes, yeah, in yes, the Bible? Yes. Okay. And you, these are supposed to point to the greater light. And you don't understand the gospel, which is the very fundamental tenet of the Christian faith. I said, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I'm going to stay here and try to promote the gospel from inside the church. So there are, there are Adventists trying to change mm -hmm. the church. I've, I've heard that from so many different people in different religions, but usually it doesn't work right. at all. You know? Now, and they still use deception. Amazing facts. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard that study. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, on, it's on TV. Presents assumptions and facts. It says the apostles taught the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath holy. They did no such thing. That's right. Now, review of Adventism. Ellen White is a continuing authority of source of truth, founded on multiple errors. The one and only true remnant church. The Sabbath is a seal of God. Sunday is a mark of the beast. The judgment started October 22, 1844. They promote the clear word, a very corrupt Bible, <laughs> as you've seen. Well, if they can beat the Jehovah's Witnesses to that, then that's about as corrupt as you can get. They teach soul sleep and condemn those who disagree, and that leads to abortion. They have multiple confusing Gospels, and they continue to promote deception. So the question comes, will the SDA church ever change? And I actually thought that after I wrote Sabbath in Christ and Cultic Doctrine, there might be a way it could change. But I've given that up. No, because people have to be supernaturally born again by the Holy Spirit. Until that happens, right. they're going to accept all the things the devil gives them in these different religions or, or whatever, or family ties or you know, retirement pay or whatever it is that keeps them in these false religions. Yeah. They, they're going to just be tied to it. So here's what Ted Wilson, president of the General Conference, said. The historic biblical beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church will not be moved, especially concerning the ministra ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The waymarks which have made us who we are are to be preserved. Mm -hmm. At the beginning we said, what are the three marks of false teachers. Mm -hmm. Do they infiltrate the church secretly under disguise, hiding their true identity? Do Edmonds do that? Absolutely. Yes, of course. Especially in their revelation seminars. Absolutely. Is there a agenda to put previously Christians under bondage? Yes, they are told yes. specifically that all Christians are to have a part in this worldwide witness, mm -hmm. being the Adventist church. Do their teachings undermine the apostolic gospel that was once for all handed down to the saints? I think Absolutely. you proved that. Yeah, you proved that crystal clear during this presentation. Now, I, I, I'm going to end here with a couple of more. A note, this is from Andrews University Focus Magazine 2009. And this is the magazine that comes out to all the yeah. uh, graduates, okay? A notable highlight for both students and faculty was a visit to the mosque of Arusha. We were given a, a brief lecture about how the mosque operates. We had to prepare ourselves to pray by washing our hands and feet and especially our nose and ears. Then we were separated, and the women were taken up to the roof to, to, uh, to pray. And here's a picture, and this is actually what it says. Students participated in the worship at an Islamic mosque in Arusha. Wow, they're even bowing down like the Muslims. So they're all bowing down, including teachers, Amazing. toward Mecca Amazing. in a, uh, a, a mosque. That's almost as bad as uh, Pope John II when he kissed the, the, the Quran. <laughs> uh, a while back. Anyway. Uh, okay, I want to end this in case there's some Adventists listening or watching. We are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. We are saved when we place our faith in the righteousness which is in Christ Jesus. Even helpless, 
ungodly sinners who are enemies of God can be made right with God when they respond to God's saving call of grace and place their faith in Christ. I remember when I first read that in Romans 5, I said, I can qualify. I'm helpless, I'm ungodly, I'm a sinner, and I don't know that I'm an enemy of God, but apparently I probably am. <laughs> and I said, I can qualify. And then I read in Romans 4 how it is not those who work. Oh, I don't have to work to receive eternal mm -hmm. life. So would you, my friends, if you're watching, commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and base your foundation on the Word of God, the gospel that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that's my prayer. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to thank our viewers for being with us today. I want you to take to heart what Dale has said in this presentation. Uh, there's lots of false prophets out there. Jesus said it in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, looking like Christians, but really underneath the ravenous wolves. We've got to be careful out there as true Christians, and if you're not a true Christian, but you're in the religion, it's very dangerous for you. And it's like Dale says, you need to get into the Word of God. Study the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study the show thyself approved a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So you've got to get into the word of God and beg God, if you're not saved, to save you. We're in a very dangerous world, uh, and only God in his mercy, grace, and power can save you from all the terrible destruction and everything we see all around us. Uh, so I ask you to, to beg Jesus Christ to save you. And if he doesn't save you today, ask him tomorrow. And again, and just keep asking him. It's sort of like that uh, lady who kept uh, bugging the unjust mm -hmm. uh, judge you know, to get justice. I want you. And finally the judge said, I'll go give it to her so she won't be nagging me all the time. Well, just keep asking God to save you. And when the day comes when you are born again by the Spirit of God, then you'll spend the rest of your eternity thanking God and praising God for what he's done for you through his son, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood. Well, with that, I want to thank you for being with us. Join us again next time. Dale, thank you for being here. God bless Glad you. Glad I could be here. And God bless you all out there. Until next time, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, John 14, 6. Amen.